feel free to skip to any of these on screen uh, if you if you prefer to hear about them. I've learnt that if you have genetics like mine, growing a beard requires you to look like a twat for several months, so I apologise for the state of my face. Um, but in this video I'm going to be talking about uh, differences in the vowel systems of modern English dialects that cause us to think about vowels differently depending on what our native accent is. English has an unusually large number of vowels in the grand scheme of things. Most languages have somewhere between three and six or seven vowels. English can have 20 or more depending on your dialect and the way that you analyse it. And having such a lot of vowels makes the vowel systems of English dialects pretty unstable and prone to changes. And this is why English accents differ so much in terms of how the vowels are pronounced and also how they're distributed between words. To start with an example from my own dialect, I came across an Instagram post a while ago which was showing the different ways that the English spelling O-U-G-H can be pronounced. And there were something like six or seven different words where O-U-G-H was pronounced differently um, in, in each word. And on the left of the post, it had the words written with their standard spelling, with the O-U-G-H. And on the right of the post, it had them written in a kind of phonetic alternative spelling that made sense and would be pronounced the same um, as the standard spelling based on English spelling convention, but was not the standard spelling. But for the word bought, as in the past tense of to buy, of course on the left it had the standard spelling B-O-U-G-H-T, and on the right it had the spelling B-O-R-T. Now for me, as a, a non-rhotic southeastern English, you know, southeastern British English speaker, this respelling makes perfect sense. Bought would be pronounced the same as this hypothetical word bought. But there were many people in the comments who didn't understand it at all, presumably people with rhotic accents, who said that it must be rage bait and that this must have been done by a non-native speaker and who on earth would pronounce this word as bought. This is an example of something that my, my much more qualified friend Dr. Jeff Lindsay talked about in one of his videos that speakers of non-rhotic accents, such as mine, learn as children to interpret the letter R a lot less literally than speakers of rhotic accents. For me, the letter R not only represents the sound R in a word like red, but it also can diacritically modify a vowel letter to make it have a different quality or a different length. So, um, a word like this would be pronounced sot, but adding an r causes it to be pronounced sort, with this long vowel or instead of a short vowel o. For me, that's how my brain processes a letter r in that context. It doesn't actually add a r, I would never say sort, but it modifies the vowel so that it's a different vowel phoneme, sort. This way of thinking about the letter R um, is a result of something that you might call the saw-saw merger, which happened in southeastern England, probably over the course of the 1700s. This was a process whereby the R sound gradually eroded away and disappeared from the language, except in situations where it was immediately followed by a vowel. So, initially these two words were pronounced differently, of course. In 1600 they might have been something like saw and sore. And then over the course of the 1700s the word sore gradually lost its R, which kind of absorbed into the vowel. So you had saw and saw. And then this or diphthong gradually smoothed to a monothongal vowel and merged with the vowel of saw. So eventually you ended up with saw and saw pronounced pretty much identically in isolation. But if you don't have the saw saw merger, you haven't necessarily got away scot free. The vowel in saw for most English speakers is the same phoneme as the vowel in court, 
And even if you haven't delved into linguistics very much, you might already know that many speakers merge the vowel in caught and the vowel in cot. You can probably tell that I don't do this. Cot, caught. In early modern English, at least in southeastern England, these vowels were perhaps a bit more similar to each other than they are in my accent. The difference might only have been that the caught vowel was held a bit longer and had lip rounding. Cot versus cut. It's important to note that speakers at the time did consider them different vowels. They could easily hear the difference between them and don't rhyme them in poetry, although they were probably more similar than they are for me. The portion of these speakers who moved to North America might have taken these two vowels with them, and eventually the length distinction collapsed and so did the lip rounding distinction. The vowels became identical, leading to a large percentage of modern Americans pronouncing them both as cart, while in southeastern England they stayed different from each other and remained different from each other in Australian and South African English. But of course, plenty of Americans don't have the cot court merger, retaining the lip rounding of the court vowel and saying instead something like cart, cot. In some accents, the difference has become more exaggerated, although not in the same way as in my accent. Cart, cot. Perhaps in these American accents, there was more pressure to keep them different because of yet another merger that caused more words to fall into the court category. You see, shortly after the first migrations of English speakers to the US, London began experiencing a sound change where that cot vowel, if it came before a f, th or s sound and in some other circumstances, began to take a different quality, eventually flipping over to the cot vowel. So by perhaps 1700, you had lot, cod, but you also had off, coffee, cost, with the same vowel as cot. This change made its way to the eastern US and is a hallmark of many urban east coast accents today, with people talking about hot coffee rather than hot coffee or hot coffee. This same split, called the lot cloth split, made its way to parts of Eastern Ireland, as the linguist John Harris pointed out to me in another video, resulting in hot coffee. And it also hung around for quite a while in London and southeastern England. When the saw saw merger I described earlier took place, this led to many speakers pronouncing often and orphan identically as orphan. Eventually accents without the split started to become more popular although working-class Londoners and extremely upper-class Londoners retained the split, saying hot coffee in the case of upper-class speakers, or hot coffee in the case of working-class speakers. As far as I know, this split has pretty much disappeared in London now. Speakers of a certain generation from parts of northern England have ended up with a lesser-known merger where court, as in a court of law, becomes identical to coat, as in a raincoat. My grandfather from Cumbria has this merger, reporting that he thinks they're homophones, and indeed they are when he says them, both sounding like cot. This is probably the result of the Cumbrian dialect, which initially had a pretty divergent sound system from standard English, experiencing a massive relexicalization, where speakers adopted a load of standard English terminology, but had to shove the words into the existing Cumbrian sound system, where there was only really one mid-height back vowel, or... Initially, the word court still had some pronounced r sound, court, but this gradually disappeared as non-roticity from the south spread northwards, leaving court as the native pronunciation for both words. In practice, my grandfather also says court, the past tense of catch, in a very similar way, court, but he reports that he doesn't feel it fits into the same category and I think this is because the dialectal Cumbrian pronunciation of this word is caut, with caut being a kind of southernism that's taken over during his lifetime. On the subject of things that sound like or, do you pronounce horse and horse the same way? Most English speakers nowadays do, but some still don't have that merger, and it is a historical merger of two sounds that used to be different. As I was writing this video, I noticed that a fantastic channel called Ray Adorn had uploaded a video about this exact merger, so I'd highly recommend their video on that, uh, and I won't focus on it here. But all the same, as Rhea points out, plenty of weird vowel changes happen before R. For example, what's the difference in pronunciation between fur and fern? 
Most English speakers would report that it's just that one has a n sound at the end and the other doesn't. But for plenty of speakers of Irish English, they also have different vowels. For fern. Those Irish speakers retain an older pattern that used to apply all across the English speaking world. There's some evidence that some southeastern English speakers even kept this distinction after the R disappeared from speech, pronouncing this word as fern rather than fern. The merged system of fur fern or fur fern eventually won out in most standard dialects. In the northern part of the British Isles, you'll find dialects that have different extremes of the distribution of the fur and fern vowels. In parts of Scotland, words like fur, as in fir tree, have yet another vowel, which I think is analysed as being the same as the kit vowel, although I don't know if I've heard this myself, so I won't attempt to say it. On the other end of the spectrum, throughout a lot of Lancashire and in Liverpool, fur, fur and fern all take the same vowel as they do in most standard accents, but the square vowel also falls into that same category, so that words like bear and burr, or hair and her, are pronounced identically. Throughout most of the area, the merged vowel has a more central tongue position. Burr, burr, her, her. But in parts of Liverpool, it's more front. Bear, bear, hair, hair. In New Zealand, that vowel in bear and square can instead merge with the near vowel so that words like cheer and chair become identical in pronunciation, something like cheer. Some varieties of African American English show another central merger of vowels before er, so that hear, hair, and her are pronounced identically as something like her. I don't think this is that common, but it was given a lot of exposure in that one Kanye West song from ages ago. A following r isn't the only thing that can cause vowels to behave interestingly. A following nasal consonant like n can also do some interesting things. Very famously, many Americans merge the short lax i and e vowels if they come before n, causing pin and pen to sound identical as something like pin. On the contrary, in some American English dialects, like in Philadelphia, there's been a phonemic split in the historic a vowel, which is raised and diphthongized in certain words and not others. Have and have sound different as have and have, where they'd be pronounced identically in many American accents. You'll have noticed that have and have are also pronounced differently in my southeastern British accent, but this is due to a different change which I outlined in an earlier video, the trap bath split. This affects various English dialects to various degrees. It began in the 1600s, and the basic pattern was originally that the a vowel became longer if it came before er, and then if it came before f, th, s, or some clusters of consonants involving n. Then, way down the line, this lengthened and slightly lowered a took a back tongue position, merging with the vowel in words like palm and calm, resulting in a split between words like trap, cat, and words like bath, cast. This split with a fully back bath vowel is more limited to southeastern British English, uh, South African English, and so on. But the lengthening of a before fricatives is more widespread, and having a longer version of the a vowel before historic er is pretty common, existing in northern English as well. Uh, as far as I know, in most northern English dialects nowadays, cat and cat are a minimal pair, which is distinguished only by the length of the vowel in cat. Even in the US, the sound is backed before r, leading to car and palm having similar vowels. In parts of Ireland, the backing never happened, and car still has a front vowel. Some accents, like mine and also Australian accents, have developed a more recent split in the short lax a vowel that varies a lot more between individuals and between dialects. This is called the bad lad split, and it leads to words like can, as in to be able to, and can, as in a tin can, differing in vowel length. Can, can. One merger so ancient that it affects almost all dialects of modern English is the meat-meat merger. There's overwhelming evidence that before about 1600, these two words were pronounced identically. At that time in southeastern England, probably meat and mate. The word mate was pronounced with an even lower vowel, met, leading to a three-way distinction, meat, mate, met. 
a merger brought these two together as meat, leaving room for this one to raise to mate, from which it diverged into its modern forms. However, in parts of Ireland from this earlier system, these vowels actually merged with each other, leaving meat separate from mate and mate, which were pronounced identically. As I discussed with John Harris in a recent video, even today some Irish people still have a distinction between beat and bait, but no distinction between bait and bait. The foot strut split is another famous one that now affects most English dialects. In the 1600s around London, the vowel in words like foot, cut, put, strut changed generally unless it was next to a consonant made with the lips, producing a contrast between foot, put and cut, strut. This split is enormously complicated, especially because it came shortly after a split between the goose and foot vowels, which were originally both oo, goose, foot. Before that vowel shortened in some words and not others, leaving goose long and foot short. This split didn't take place in Scotland. In fact, that whole vowel was shifted to a front tongue position decades or centuries earlier, and they were both pronounced something like goose and foot. In modern Scots, they can be as front as guess, fit. I mentioned some mergers that involve vowels weakening to a central tongue position before er, but they can also do that in other situations, especially in unstressed syllables, but not always. Jeff Lindsay has a video outlining the strut comma merger, where in American English the strut vowel falls well within the range of the unstressed vowel at the end of comma, strut, comma. It's difficult to judge whether this is a phonemic merger or not, because the comma vowel only occurs in unstressed syllables and the strut vowel only occurs in stressed ones. But as they're in complementary distribution, see Jeff Lindsay's latest video, and they now sound pretty much the same, it does seem most economical to use the same phonemic symbol for both. This is in contrast to accents like mine, where the two vowels are quite different in quality. Strut, comma, a, uh, a. Uh. However, in accents similar to mine, the put vowel is centralising and becoming increasingly unrounded, so one day maybe we'll see a merger of that kind. Put, comma. I don't know if any speakers are quite there yet. In a similar vein, New Zealand speakers have centralised their kit vowel so much that it can be analysed as the same as the comma vowel. Cut, comma. And finally, a merger so complicated that I think it will take another full video to outline, the weak vowel merger. Some dialects of English, including mine, have managed to maintain a subtle but phonemic distinction between two vowels that can occur in unstressed syllables, meaning that Lenin and Lenin are pronounced differently, and chicken and sicken don't rhyme. To speakers with this distinction, it's obvious. You wouldn't rhyme chicken and sicken in a poem any more than you'd rhyme cut and mat in a poem but the actual acoustic difference is fairly slight. In, un, Lenin, Lenin. And it's difficult to even hear if you have these two merged. I promise you it does exist. As far as I know, most people around the Anglosphere have some degree of merger here, so that chicken and sicken rhyme, for example, uh, in American English. Chicken, sicken. Um, but they may still preserve a distinction where there's some kind of suffix, as in the famous example, roses and roses. In non-rhotic accents that have the weak vowel merger, words like batted and battered sound identical, as in Liverpudlian, battered. This list is by no means exhaustive, but I think it's interesting to think about the range of directions that different dialects can take a vowel system. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you again soon.